we'll double the other area. <laughs> Um, a, a warm welcome uh, to, to uh, those of you who are joining us over here. There might be a couple more people who are, who are joining us still. And, and an incredibly warm welcome to Bert. I'm, I'm enormously grateful, Bert, for you to, uh, giving of your time today. Um, as I think some of you will know that I, uh, I, I'm, I'm just on the cusp of my 50th birthday. And Bert is actually on the cusp of, a, of an even more significant uh, milestone moment but do you want to do you want to just share what you were sharing with me just before yes um yesterday i taught my last class as a full-time faculty member at the jewish theological seminary and um in the fall i have what jts unfelicitously refers to as a terminal sabbatical uh, but following that sabbatical <laughs> at the end of 2021 i formally <laughs> retire from my my teaching position and become emeritus. So I'm grateful to all of you for easing and not having the trauma of a last class because now I get one more class and I'm, I'm delighted to study with you and uh, hear what nonsense Jeremy has been filling your heads with and be able to give a corrective. Um, but uh, as, as you I'm sure know, I, uh, and I hope you share my affection. I. I love my former student, my beloved colleague. And I think that at least from this side of the Atlantic, it looks like he does absolutely everything right. Um, <laughs> so to, to be at the synagogue and, and filling the shoes of Louis Jacobs is no small task. And the fact that Jeremy seems to do it so well is truly, truly, for me, I, I'm shepping nachos every day. Yeah. Yeah. That's that, that that's really kind, but it it, it just it reminds me of one of my favorite jokes. Do you know what they call retired rabbis? No, what? Rabbis. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think it goes for academics as well. Um, <clears throat> so uh, let me let me let me just do just a, a piece of this, but because you uh you know you deserve it. You are the Ackerman Professor of Midrash and Interreligious Studies at JTS, uh, a graduate of Harvard. Um, visiting faculty, as you said, at Oxford, Cambridge, Princeton, the Russian State University of Humanities. Um, and, and actually a really interesting part of your interreligious journey is your relationship with Pope Benedict and, uh, and, a, and a whole uh, series of, 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 of interreligious engagements. Among your books are um, Aphrodite and the Rabbis, How Do You Adapt to Roman Culture, Stage tales, wisdom, and wonder from the rabbis of the Talmud. You move between the more academic works. Um, just I remember during my time at uh, JTS, you published a, you know, an, a series of academic articles um, as Golden Bells and Pomegranate Studies on Vayikra rubber, uh, Leviticus rubber, um, but also you know uh, writing for for the general public and um, uh, the Genesis of, eth of Ethics. I think is probably uh, um, is probably your your best seller. I would guess, right? Is that is that right? I think Aphrodite's giving it a run for its money. Um, it, whoever, it's whoever, nice. whoever put that title in did very well. Just, just so no one be too impressed with that. Uh, in Jewish studies, if you sell two thousand books, that's a huge bestseller. So, uh, not, not, and, and I try to assign it to everyone, which guarantees me something. Um, and the other way, of course, as Jeremy himself knows, is if you want people to read your books. You buy them yourself, and then you give them away to people. <laughs> so let's let, let's get down let's get down to business. Um, how how do you how do you define midrash? Talk about having the shoe on the other foot. This is one of my favorite exam questions for my students. How do you define midrash? And I will say um, very clearly over the years because I do publish a lot and I've been publishing since the early 80s so that's a long run that my definition of midrash has changed over the years very early on it was much more generic interpretation of scripture and I didn't qualify who was doing the interpreting over time and and through my interreligious dialogue work I came to realize that we we needed a stronger definition my teacher of new testament my, my rabbi, as it were, uh, Father Raymond E. Brown, a, a Roman Catholic priest, may he really rest in peace. Um, he came, became a dear, dear friend of mine. But um, he talked about the famous infancy narratives in the Gospel of Matthew. And you know that uh, in, the, in the Christmas story, 
baby Jesus was born in a manger in Bethlehem. But what you may not know is that that story is only told in the Gospel of Matthew. And even Matthew, to say the least of the other Gospels, all know that Jesus is from Nazareth. So how do you get from Nazareth to Bethlehem? Nazareth is in the Galilee. Bethlehem is in the south. And Ray Brown pointed out that Matthew himself says that the reason he's telling the story of the baby in the manger in Bethlehem is to fulfill a verse of the Hebrew prophet Micah. In the Tanakh, Micha chapter 5, verse 1 says, Viata Beit Lechem Ephrata, you a prince of Bethlehem, who are um, known already for a thousand years, your origins are of old. Clearly a messianic verse in the prophet Micha. And Ray Brown, in his book, The Birth of the Messiah, says that this is a midrash on the verse in Micah. And because he was my teacher, I kind of accepted the fact that there could be the possibility of Christian midrash. But the more I thought about it, the more it gnawed at me that midrash could have as its goal and end the notion that Jesus of Nazareth or Jesus of Bethlehem was the Messiah, son of God. That just seemed wrong to me. It, it, I, I felt that Midrash needed to be, by definition, a Jewish undertaking. So my first nuance was that Midrash's Jewish interpretation of the Hebrew Bible, of the Tanakh. But then I nuanced it even further. When I studied among the Dead Sea Scrolls, I saw that the scrolls, maybe once or twice in all of the scrolls, use the term Midrash. But far and away, hundreds of times, they call their own interpretive endeavor Pesher, Peshin Resh. So they had their own terminology. And I came to realize that even though the term Midrash is found in the Hebrew Bible, it's in Ezra chapter 7, it's in Genesis, in fact, um, that now I would define Midrash. I'm finally answering your question, Jeremy. And this way, everyone will know I'm a rabbi because you asked a simple question and got a very complicated answer. But um, Midrash is rabbinic interpretation of the Tanakh. Okay, let's, let, let, let's, let's play with that. And we've looked at some of these kinds of dynamics in the course of our, um, in the course of our studies. I've talked about the way that perhaps sometimes Midrash emerges out of this thing of Targum. Sometimes you've got this thing of the Petichter, and we've looked at, you know, a ton of, of, of Tichter art, and then kind of, you know, continuing to sort of move through time on the, on the sort of more recent end of the scale of kind of classic Midrash, you start to get into, um, you know, poetry and liturgical poetry particularly. Um, how, do you, how do you see that kind of flow of those, some of those sort of different genres in the context of, 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 of Midrash? Again, I'm going to give you a complicated answer. First of all, I think Midrash is an ongoing process. I think your most recent book, your children's book, is a beautiful example of modern Midrash because you're clearly interpreting stories. And not only that, I think the rabbis, the ancient rabbis, share your agenda of taking rabbinic Jewish ideas, deriving them from the Bible, but applying them to the here and now. So Midrash speaks to the now. It brings the Bible home to the current moment. In its origins, Midrash in, in the book of Genesis, for instance, when is it uh, Rebecca who has the twins? Rachel? Rachel has the twins? Um, she goes to seek an oracle. Darash. She goes to seek an oracle. So Midrash at its earliest origins is seeking out God's will. It's reading the text so that God continues to speak to us. If you will, in these weeks in the run-up to Shavuot, it's basically taking the event at Sinai and making sure that that event is not a one-time event, but an eternal event. So early on, the rabbis read scripture, I would say, in two different modes. One mode was that the Bible was a divine code and you needed, as it were, the, the, the decoding ring or the right lenses. And, and that would be associated with the school of Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva 
felt that there was nothing superfluous in scripture. Every additional word, every extra vav, you could interpret and as it were, make hermeneutical hay. You could find meaning in every jot and every tittle of scripture. His colleague, Rabbi Ishmael, rebuked him. Rabbi Ishmael said, Akiva, that the Torah, meaning God's word, is delivered in human discourse. And human discourse means we repeat ourselves. We say in the middle of a sentence, ah, or you know, there are all of these interjections. And we should not make extra meaning where no extra meaning was intended. So one side is reading fairly plainly, the other side is reading allegorically. And that persistence of reading, those two attitudes are also frankly found in the early church. The church fathers, when they read what they call the Old Testament, they have an allegorical school, and then they have what they call a theoria or historia. Um, in later rabbinic Judaism, we would make the distinction between drash, midrash, making the Bible mean something today, versus pshat, what the verse means in its original context. I want to I want to push back on that because I I you know I I've you know learned that and partly from you, but the experience of going through you know literally line by line through you know getting on for a third of Bereshit rubber is not quite that I think I think there's there 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 is, there, is, there, is, there is something else like sometimes there's a verse where you know and, and the classic Russian would be it cries out Darshani right you know there, there's just a problem there's a spectacularly obvious you know, a problem might be a contradiction, or it just seems like like brutally um, pointless. But the, if you were to ask me the percentage split between that and the other thing, I'd say that's about five to ten percent of Horatio Rubber, and the rest of the time, it's delight, it's play, it's a kind of flexing of muscle. It's a you know one of the analogies that I've used is a kind of like a kneading of dough. It's a kind of um you know like there's a, there's a sort of playfulness in the encounter, which is particularly this school of, you know, of, of um, Agadic, uh, Palestinian Midrash, and we'll, we'll, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll focus a bit more on that in a second. But like, to what extent is Midrash the desperate will to understand the will of God? And to what extent is it a kind of a playful exercise? How would you, how would you understand that? I, I don't see a distinction between the two, which is to say that among the rabbis, and I'm including myself here, there is a love of God and a love of God's text. And that love sometimes plays itself out in very serious ways, but most often plays itself out in delight, in joy, just like a relationship where you love someone. A good pairing, a good partnering in love means that there will be a great deal of laughter, there will be joy. And I think that's how the rabbis approach scripture. Scripture is their record of God's love for Israel and their way of showing Israel's love for God. So of course there will be play, of course there will be delight. I also want to point out that you're reading Bereshit Rabbah, and there is no early Tanaitic Midrash on Bereshit, but the other five books, four books of the Bible, um, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, they all have early Midrash, and that Midrash also spends a fair amount of time worrying about uh, Jewish law, halacha. Bereshit Rabbah virtually ignores halacha, and the truth is there aren't a lot of halachot in the book of Genesis. Now, I want to be clear, the halachot that are there are very important. After all, um, circumcision is one of the halachot. Pru or vu, be fruitful and multiply, is one of the halachot. Um, the gid hanasha, the sciatic nerve, which prevents us from eating, um, uh, what, what do they call that steak? I don't even know what it's called. Uh, very, some, some very- It's rump, yeah. S say it again, Sally? I think it's rump steak. Rump steak, for sure, yeah. but there's some cut that, filet mignon, that's what I was trying to think of. Um, and the only place you can get filet mignon, well, actually, I don't know, I shouldn't speak for Great Britain. In America, there is no one, I think, who knows how to remove the sciatic nerve. In Israel, if you're willing to pay enough money, there is a shochet who knows how to do it. Um, but, uh, you know, so those are the halachot of Genesis. 
clearly not enough to make a whole halachic midrash. I'm sorry. Someone... Presumably they do it in Argentina. If you go to Argentina, they have shochtim there who say they know how to do it correctly. You know, also, Lester, you're, you're absolutely right. I taught a number of years ago now, I taught, like I'm doing with you, I taught a long distance course on Skype to um, the students at the Seminario Rabinico Latino Americano. Should I translate from the Spanish? Uh, now you've heard all of my Spanish too. Um, but I taught them in uh, a Midrash class. And the deal was that I would teach for eight, 10 weeks, whatever it was. And then at the end, I flew down there for a, a seven day stint, five days in Buenos Aires and two days then I went up to, um, to Brazil uh, for Shabbat. But um, I ate more fleshics there than I've ever eaten in my life. I'm sure when I came back from Argentina, my cholesterol was through the roof. Uh, very, very much so. Yes, you're absolutely right. But even so, I don't recall eating filet mignon. That doesn't mean they let's, don't let's, have it. Let's, let's, let's bring it back to this question of Midrash, right? You're right. <laughs> there's, not a lot of, there's not a lot of halacha in Bereshit rubber. And actually, one of the things that we've seen as we've been kind of studying is when all of a sudden the rabbis start to do halacha. Like there's a kind of there's a shifting of gear that we've hit every now and again, where yes. all of a sudden you start to recognize an approach that perhaps we would recognize more familiarly from the bubbly or something like that. But you're right. By and large, they're not doing it. And they're just they're just having fun. I mean, there's that classic to me. There's that incredibly beautiful Jewish idea of devar acher, right, where you have a runner or something. And then you just have another run at it. Or, you know, I mean, perhaps the thing that we see, um, I, I mean, classically, you do see it in the Talmud, but it just seems even more celebratorily delightful in Midrash. You know, Rabbi so-and-so over Rabbi so-and-so. One rabbi says X, one rabbi says Y. Gegers to hate, you know, move on. Well, well I, you... I, I want to distinguish, though, between halacha and agadah. In halacha, rabbis can disagree all they want. But one rabbi can't disagree with himself. There's only one correct meaning. Whereas in Agadah, one rabbi can offer you 70 interpretations, or as they say, shivim panim la Torah. There are 70 facets to the highly polished gem of scripture. What one of my teachers called the indeterminacy of meaning. So in Agadah, there's all possibility. Why is that? I think because an early Midrash formulates it as follows. Do you want to know the one who spoke and brought the world into being? For that, you need to learn Agada. Because there's no one path by which we can know God. There is no straight and narrow. God can tell us how to behave. That's halacha. But for us to know God, we need to take every possible path because God is infinitely complex. So, and I think that is part of the, the program of Bereshit Rabbah, so much so that with all of the delight, there is a very serious work of collecting, of collecting everything they can find that relates to these verses of scripture. So much so, I did a count once, that 92% of the verses in Genesis, 92% are accounted for in Genesis Rabbah. They do verses, they do parts of verses, they do individual words. If you started at the very beginning of Genesis, you know, sometimes they'll even take time just contemplating one letter of Genesis. Why is that? Because if it is the word of God, then any letter, any jot, any tittle is worth our time because it is a way for us to hear from God. Let, I mean, let, let me play with that. When I arrived at JTS, my, you know, the, the, my major inspiration among the faculty was your former dearly beloved colleague I know of blessed memory, Neil Gilman. Um, and when I got kind of halfway through my rabbinical sort of journey, I went to talk to Neil about possibly doing a, a, a master's in theology. And he told me to go and study Midrash. And you unfortunately got lumbered with me for a couple of years. But um, what you're talking about there, about the plurality that, that, that Midrash delights in, a Gaddic Midrash in particular, it is theological, right? I mean, it is, it, it is a celebration of the nature of God refracted through human beings doing something rather than necessarily defining God, but like it, it expresses itself through the thing itself. So I, I would distinguish between that latter 
thing and theological. Theological assumes some kind of systematic study, which is why Gilman said, go study Midrash. Um, we don't do theology, we do story, we do narrative. And through narrative, we test the limits of our Jewish identity. We define our identity by telling stories about who we are. I'll give you two classical stories. And I want to say, and I'm saying this with all due caution, that I'm not sure that these stories actually happen. These stories are rabbinic narrative. They're Jewish narrative. The first story, which is central to our identity, is God took us out of Egypt. We were slaves in Egypt unto Pharaoh, and God took us out with a strong hand and an outstretched arm. By the way, recently I have defined um, a strong hand is the hand that is holding the syringe with the vaccine. And the outstretched arm is the arm in which you're going to get your shot. But, uh, the, and that's how we get to redemption. But we tell this story that God took us out of Egypt. And then I have to ask myself the question, well, since there's very little historic evidence that this happened, and the number 600,000 adult males means 2 million people left Egypt at one, one fell swoop, it, it seems very unlikely. But that forces me to then say, well, why do we tell this story? How odd of us to say we were slaves. If we're making it up, we should say we're princes. We're, 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 we were you know, wonderfully wealthy. We came from the smartest of the smartest. And instead, we say we were lowly slaves. And the Talmud tells us again and again and again. In fact, it quotes, counts the Bible. And it says, the Bible says, as much as three dozen times that we were slaves in the land of Egypt. And that teaches us that we must be kind and loving to the stranger, to the poor among us. We should be sympathetic because we were once there. So that's a very, very powerful message. It's a wonderful story and it's very self-defining. The other end of that is that 49 days later, we found ourselves at the foot of a mountain, or as the Midrash likes to say, under a mountain. God had the mountain suspended above us, and God said, well, I have some commandments for you. If you want them, great. If you don't, I'm going to drop the mountain on you. And for obvious reasons, we Jews said, we will do and we will uh, listen, we will obey. But that's the other side, the other corollary. We went from an enslavement to Egypt in Egypt to an enslavement to God, that we willingly enslaved ourselves to perform the commandments, to be God's people, that God would be our sovereign and protect us. Indeed, God already did that by taking us out of Egypt. And from that point forth, we would undertake to obey God's command. So those two myths are really defining myths of who we are as Jews. And to this very day, whether it's here in New York or there in London, it affects how we think about ourselves and how we behave. I mean, I, 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 it's so interesting because just before you were, you were, you, you sent us to that classic midrash of the children of Israel standing underneath the mountain. This phrase was already in my mind as a phrase that has kind of been, you know, like, like a story of mine. Sorry, I kind of like the narrative of my rabbinic journey post my studying but in a room you know with you which is nasev and nishma which which is usually understood to say don't worry about whether or not shabbat helps you be a more holy person just keep shabbos and you'll get it but for me my experience at jts was so much of studying midrash and then going out to practice being a maradatra to being like a you know halakhic authority in a community but it turns out that my my being a halakhic authority is incredibly conditioned by my experience of doing naase, you know, midrash, you know, exposing myself to the sense of delight, the sense of the the values and the the mores that get gently instilled through stories more effectively than through being told what to do, and particularly through that kind of commitment to a kind of plurality of of truths. I mean, you know, Brian, I, you know, I remember just conversations that you and I, in particular, just out of everybody who's here. 
have had, particularly as we at New London went through a journey about becoming egalitarian. Like my halachic leadership on an issue like that is shaped through Dafka, the study of Bereshit Rubber, which, you know, sometimes has something to say about gender. You know, uh, Jane, you know, will, will, will share with me large, largely not very warm about women in general, but we are conditioned through doing Midrash into seeing the world and to behaving the, in the world and being a rabbi in the world, particularly. Any any thoughts on that? I, I wholeheartedly agree. And, and I remind you that Midrash comes in many flavors. Um, we do Midrash Agada. We certainly do narrative and we love the narrative. But there's also Midrash Halacha, by which we read the Torah to try and determine what God wants of us and how the authoritative record of our covenant with God, that record that we call Torah, how that is reflected in our practice and how we learn our practice by constantly going back to the Torah to try and see what God wants. Now, God may express God's self through the words of Torah, but the words of Torah are always conditioned by the community in which we live. We learn to hear nishma. We learn to do that um, by listening to our fellow human beings, by listening to our own contemporary moment. So Midrash is absolutely essential, not only for the narrative and the delight that we have, but also for the nitty gritty of how to behave. We need Midrash both ways. Um, uh, thank you. So, I mean, you know, we're, 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 we're I think, at sort of halfway uh, through, as it were, our time together. I want, I want to do um, uh, one, one more kind of conversation that's been really interesting to me, and, and I'm afraid, you know, everybody else is going to have to just put up with that for a bit. I hope it'll be interesting for you guys as well. Um, and then I want to bridge into some study of a text, and, you know, we're, we're, we're in, we're in Bereshit Rabbah 36, and, but I'd love to just, you know, ask you to start walking us through, um, through a text, and, and that, that's kind of where, where, where I imagine we'll go. But um, let me come back. Let me let me come to this question that has has really struck me going through Barisha Rubber in the way that I have been for this um, this class, um, which is a question about redaction. Um, we are looking at clearly a brilliantly put together literary work. You know, we talk sometimes about conversations in the Bet Midrash as distinct from this kind of you know this thing that now appears. Um, bound between, you know, papers or, you know, uploaded into Safaria. Um, and one of the things that's really struck me is that it just feels like there are shifts of redactorial voices, that you get a run of, I don't know, you know, five, six, seven, eight midrashim, sometimes as much as a chapter, but rarely, rarely a full chapter, just full of Greek or, you know, full of fascination with animals or full of every other verse is from Ezekiel or Isaiah or Jeremiah. And then boom, the kind of the, 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 the voice just changes. And then there's another completely different kind of redactorial fascination that expresses itself. So, you know, I'd love to get to the more kind of technical side of that, but perhaps just sort of take us into how do we end up with Bereshit Rubber? And like, what is this as a, as a redacted document that we now have? So when you say redacted, that's just a nice word for edited, right? Or, or public, I know, public. At the moment, well, listen, we're studying Torah Shebechtav, right? We're studying a written down book and we call it Torah Sheba al -Peh. We call it oral Torah. And, and somewhere somewhere along that kind of, you know, journey, there was originally something oral and there is now something written, you know. So indeed, and the shift takes place pretty much as Judaism moves into Europe around the year 1000, um, when suddenly there was uh, the a great availability of paper and printing. And so oral works began to be much more readily inscribed. So inscription is part of that. But that means that for the first thousand years from the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 CE up to around, give or take, you know, hundred years, the year 1000, we did our editing, we did our publishing, we did our transmission of text, the Alpa, orally. It quite literally was that way. So when we talk about literature, we're talking about literature in the same vein that we talk about Homer as literature. This is recited material, and it is passed down from mouth to ear orally. So that changes our notion also of how an editor edits, because we think of editing uh, sometimes literally cutting and pasting on a page, writing words down, scratching them out. 
when you are memorizing material, it's notoriously difficult to unremember something. So once it's remembered, it's on the record. And sometimes it's easier to collect material, to compile material, than it is to artfully edit. And I think that Genesis Rabbah and its sister Midrash Vayikra Rabbah, Leviticus Rabbah, are of that ilk, that they are not as artfully edited as we love to read them to be, but in fact, they are compiled. And what you have is someone collecting all the material, and forgive me, this is going to be sexist, but this is the patriarchal society the rabbis lived in, there he is collecting all the material he can and attaching it to verses of Genesis. So some of the chapters, as you'll see in the hundred chapters of Genesis, Genesis Rabbah, the book of Genesis in the Bible, 50 chapters, Genesis Rabbah, the new, improved, big Genesis is a hundred chapters. And they, the, the editors, and here I'm using a plural because I suspect as you now have seen, that there were a series of editors over a number of years, um, adding material, um, refining material, uh, almost never eliminating material. Um, it's like the reform prayer book. It only gets bigger and bigger. It never quite gets chopped out because um, it's retained orally and everything is worth it because it's all Torah. Who am I to decide which rabbi to eliminate from the collection? So I think they're just continually collecting. And as you saw, if you already read some of chapter 36, much of the material they collect is mythic folklore. They love this stuff because they know that people sit up and pay attention and say, what? <laughs> You're telling me what? Um, and, and sometimes we, we traffic in almost the unbelievable. And... Um, if I may, a, a, an interfaith moment. One of my great critiques of Christianity is the basic myth of Christianity, that Jesus loved humanity enough to become a human being. God becomes human and then winds up getting crucified. Um, that That's, to me, an unbelievable story. And that's why I'm not a Christian. I, I just can't believe it. On the other hand, I have no problem saying God split the Red Sea and we walked through on dry land. So um, I guess we all live with our own myths happily and we poo-poo other people's myths. And whether we believe them or not is, I think, less the question than whether they serve a function for defining who we are. I'm not sure I answered your question. I've completely forgotten it. Yeah. Um I mean, you know, and, and, and that, that, that's part of Midrash, right? Like, you know, like you, you rarely get, you rarely get the, you certainly rarely get the answer that you were expecting if you, if you, if you go into, if you go into Midrash. But let me, let me have another go at this kind of, you know, technical piece. I mean, I, I came across an, an article up in JSTOR where someone went through and counted the number of, you know, Etmahas that were in different chapters in Bereshit Rubber, you know, and, and sometimes it's up in the sort of, you know, you know, 30, 40 a chapter, and then you get like eight or nine chapters where it doesn't appear at all, and then bang, it's back up to 25, and then, it, you know, it disappears off again. Um, when you said that it, it's not a single person, it's clearly not a single person, but I think there are there are kind of longer strain um, moments. I mean, you know, chapter 36, it starts off absolutely incredibly theologically daring, you know, zips off to demons, and then three midrashim later, Asmodeus just comes back in again, and it just brackets this. It, I mean, there is like a, a, a long-range literary beauty that spans about four or five midrashim that is kind of very, um, it's very appealing to me poetically. Um, and then, you know, like, and then, and then there's some, other, you know, sometimes. I mean, one of the things that I, I've sometimes said in this room is, oh, this is a great midrash. Or, you know, this isn't such a great midrash. It's a bit more plinky plonky, and like, maybe I've missed it. But some of it is just a lot better than some other of it. Um, who's, you know, is that, is, you know, do you do you share that? Is there a, you know, I mean, a Soloveitchik famously said, right? It doesn't matter which Mishnah you study. You know, you should, if you're feeling really miserable, you know, go and study a whole lot. Go and study Mishnah from, uh, you know, from from the most boring, as it were, um, part at all. Do you, how do you, how do you, how do you respond to that? Are you more drawn to areas, less drawn to other areas? What, what, what guides you? Hey, there are certainly 
midrashim that I find dead boring, um, that, that they don't do much for me. Uh, this particular one uh, it is endlessly appealing, whether it's the babies cutting their own umbilical cords, or famously Robbie Mayer saying that God hides behind a curtain like a Roman judge would hide behind the curtain, and his colleagues saying, Mayer, shut up, right? This is what the generation of the flood said. I mean, he really has put out a heresy there that God doesn't care. And that kind of deist worldview that God is, I, I mean, it's, it's really the, the worst kind of Epicureanism that uh, the rabbis just find that abhorrent, um, which of course draws all of us in, that a rabbi as famous as Mayer could utter such a heresy tells you that these guys are very serious. They think not only about text, but they think about the world they see. Um, you know, we're living through what we think of as an unprecedented pandemic and how much we genuinely have suffered and how many hundreds of thousands of people, if not millions of people have died. But in the ancient world, that wasn't a once in a century event. That was a once in a decade event. Um, disease ran rampant. So when they look at scripture and then they look at the world, um, sometimes they can come to a very radical conclusion that God is either cruel or God doesn't care about humanity or, and this is the most likely rabbinic theodicy, oh my God, have we been sinners. God never does anything that we don't deserve. In which case we're blaming the victim. And Blaming the victim is not what we would call nowadays being a good um, pastor. I mean, it is fascinating that to me, let, let, let's do this theodicy piece, that, that to me, one of the things that I love most about Bereshit Rubber is how brave it is when it gets into this question of why bad things are happening and how, re you know, comparatively rarely it moves into that deuteronomist theology of, you know, if, if you've done, you know, you, you are getting punished if you have done something wrong, right? You know, um, how, how frequently it moves off into other directions and it, it, it attacks the, um, the omniscient, the omnipresence, the omnibeneficence, the omnipotentiality of, of God. I mean, that brave these rabbis again and again and again. Yeah, we, we think that, you know, we have chutzpah or theological panache and I think they run circles around us. Um, I, I want to start with a story, though, to answer this, because many, many years, literally many decades ago now, I taught a high school class at JTS um, for uh, a group of very self-motivated kids. They would come on Sundays and Wednesdays to study, um, junior, seniors in high school. And um, I, I spent much of a semester talking about Deuteronomy and theodicy. And in the literally the very last class of the semester, something prompted me to check in with the students. And I said, so, okay, let's just see who can define theodicy. And one girl's hand went up immediately. And I said, Dina. And she said, theodicy was an epic poem by Homer. And I said, yes, but not the theodicy I've been talking about all semester. Um, so this, this kind of almost misprision of, of what we're talking about. Um, the rabbis have very strong theodicy, even in Genesis, Rabbi. They would prefer to take God off the hook. They want God to be, as we say, Hatsur Tamim Po'alo, the rock whose works are perfect. So even as they chip away at God's omnis, um, they also deeply desire a perfect God. Um, but they do engage in myth-making, and, and there it's the Odyssey like the Odyssey, like Homer, that the rabbis understand very much the power of myth to shape identity, and part of the identity is our relationship to the gods. Um, to this day, people speak of me vis-a-vis um, -vis my students as a mentor, and then I always ask them, so what are the students? And then they say, well, a mentee? And I say, no, the student should be a Telemachus because I know the Odyssey and I know that mentor was in fact the goddess Athena 
in the guise of Telemachus's tutor. So you, you have to appreciate the staying power of Homeric myth, just like we have to appreciate the staying power of rabbinic myth. When in just a very few weeks, we celebrate Shavuot, we will sing that it is Zaman Matan Toratenu, the time of the giving of the Torah. I don't know British custom. In New York, we eat cheesecake. Um, not clear to me why we eat cheesecake, but we eat cheesecake. Um, but the myth is, is that Shavuot is about the giving of the Torah because that's nowhere in the Torah itself. In the Torah, Shavuot is simply a harvest festival. It's the barley harvest. First fruits, Bikurim. You want to celebrate Shavuot, eat figs. But the myth is very powerful. And the myth is, this is the time we receive the Torah, which means annually we undertake to receive the Torah and to receive it anew, which means that we renegotiate the contract with ourselves. What is that Torah we're receiving? And at New London, I think that's true. You have an evolving sense of what it means to be deeply committed Jews. And depending on your rabbi, whether it was Louis Jacobs or Jeremy, um, it's going to shift and of necessity because we change from year to year. Um, I, 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 I like the idea of the comparison. I, I, I'm, I'm more, I think the, 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 the scale might be as Homer is to rabbinic myth, but never mind. Let's, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 let, let, let's, let's, let's do this. Let's, let's have a look at some text, but um, with you, um, I, I, I've, I've, how, how big is that? Is that is that good enough for you? Well, I, I have you've a text. You got the text. Me, you got so. the text to hand. So, I mean, do you want to start just taking us through this? And you know, we 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 went through. I think this we did this about two or three weeks ago. We're we're slightly further through the chapter than this, but it's such an interesting midrash. Maybe we sh you know just uh just you know if you can uh, take take us through. What are the kinds of things that that your eye is drawn to as you as you work through a text like this? Well, we open not with the Noah verse which is just some scribe's way of telling you where we are in Genesis. The Midrash actually opens with the verse from Job. And it, it, the rabbis love to take a verse, if you will, from afar and use it as the key to unlock the door of the text they're aiming at. So one verse opens another verse. We see this and we saw this on Passover Seder night where you get one verse after another from Deuteronomy 26, and the rabbis constantly bring you another verse to unlock the meaning of the Deuteronomy verse. Here, you get a verse from the book of Job. Job, I want to remind you, is not part of the synagogue liturgy. We don't read Job on any holiday. So the rabbis go to Job with a faint assurance that their students don't really know Job very well. It's as though Job was put there for the sake of writing Midrash and, and finding proof texts and verses that can help us unlock other verses. So when Rabbi Meir says, yashkitu mi Shia, when God is silent, who will think ill of God? Panim, and when God hides God's face, mi yushurenu, who can see God? And this is true whether it's on a national level or on the individual level. And then Rabbi Meir suggests that God is silent from God's world. And God hides God's face from God's world. And then he gives an analogy. This is like a Roman judge who literally draws a curtain. Um, I want to see what your text says. Um, the, um, the manuscripts, instead of kala, they have the letter bet instead of the chaf and, and a yud. So it says vila, vilon, that like a, a judge who draws a curtain over his face so he does not know what goes on outside. So a little bit about the Roman world. In the Roman world, a judge with the best of intentions claims 
that he's going to sit behind a curtain so he does not know who is standing in front of him in judgment and therefore cannot be biased. You would think that's a good thing, except that everybody knew that the judge behind the curtain was maybe not even there. He was reading a book. He was writing letters. He was trusting with his mistress. No one knew where the judge was, so they didn't like that. And they thought that Roman justice, for the sake of that curtain that they drew, meant that the judge was absent. So when Robbie Mayer says that, his colleagues are appalled. They say, Mayer, enough. Kach amru dor hamabul. You're saying what the very generation of the flood said. In other words, what you are saying out loud is what caused God to want to destroy the world. This is an extreme heresy. I, can I just say something? We, we know from the Torah that a judge you can't see is bad because in the opening of Shoftim, it says that you should not take um, shachad, you shouldn't take bribery because bribery blinds the eyes of the judge. So like um, justice being blind, right? I mean, we, we have the statue on top of the, uh, on top of, I think it's the old Bailey in this, in this country. A blind judge is not good, right? A, a, um, uh, uh, it's Rawlsian, right? The, 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 the veil, of, um, the veil of ignorance. It's not a Jewish concept. Um, well, first of all, I'm not sure that Rawls was not quite comfortable with Jewish thought or Jewish thought quite compatible with Rawls. Um, but that said, your statue of the blind justice on top of the old Bailey, um, I think is meant to be a good thing uh, because the same passages you were quoting also say that you should not prefer one person to another, the rich over the poor. In other words, blind justice means you are without bias. Um, but in the Roman world, as opposed to, of course, the Jewish world, where our judges are pure and never impugned, in the Roman world, it meant that the judges literally were blinded to any possibility of doing justice. And that's why the rabbis so object to Rabbi Meir. He's really out there. But the re response is, you know, God, in fact, gave a great deal of um, benefit Dafka to the generation of the flood. That generation lived well. So who's going to come along and say that they were guilty? In other words, the only one that can come along and say they were guilty is the judge that Mayer is saying is blind. God is the one that has to do justice. So that, of course, begs the question. So what benefit did God give that generation? And they go again to Job, and they find this lovely verse that um, the generation of the flood, and this is a rare moment, really, for the rabbis being incredibly sympathetic to women, um, that, that it, it was so good in the generation of the flood that by the time women got pregnant until the time they delivered was a mere three days. Imagine only having to carry your children for three days. And then when your delivery came, the baby just popped right out and it popped out and it had the ability to run around and actually help be a, a good um, a physician's assistant um, by helping cut the umbilical cord. Uh, the baby itself could do this. So this is an incredible fantasy, a rabbinic fantasy that is well received. Um, I, I said to you uh, before everybody else got on, this Midrash is told almost verbatim again in Leviticus Rabbah. In other words, it's a much beloved mythic narrative. Um, and of course, in the version of the story we're reading, when the baby runs off to find a flint to cut its own umbilical cord, uh-oh, it runs into the demon. The um, I love the Aramaic, Ravhon, the, the rabbi of all the demons, um, Osmodius. And they wrestle um, like you might wrestle with Dracula or Jacob wrestling with his angel until dawn. And as the sun comes up, the demon must hide because the sun, I guess, will make the demon melt or something. And so as Modius, the wrestling might, but the wrestling might be in, in Vika rubber. It's not in Bereshit rubber. They just have this banter of words, which is kind of, um, which is fascinating to me. Like I, 
it just you know it just happens to be a, 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 a dawn and they have this kind of like um verbal standoff to me that was quite interesting in terms of a kind of like a non-violent jewish uh, uh, sort of engagement. But i i want to turn to what um asmodeus says he says in aramaic of course zeal globally um I, I have to do this in brooklyn english you know go tell your mother um go tell your mother that um the cock has crowed for if it had not i would have smacked you and killed you so there is violence here but it, it, you're right that it's only the implication of violence but the baby then says zil at glogla imach um in in some texts it says ima dimach go tell your grandmother right the lo katati mishare you're lucky my mother didn't cut my umbilical cord because had my umbilical cord been cut, I would have smacked you and killed you. I, it's just a phenomenal exchange. The little talking baby who literally still attached to the umbilical cord can run around, wrestle, or at least debate with a demon and be, be a smart aleck. Um, this is the stuff of rabbinic fantasy. And rabbinic fantasy is incredibly rich. And I think it's rich because it captures the heart of the listener. You can't hear this story and not think about what is the nature of humanity that from our, literally from the moment of our birth, we are wrestling with our demons. We are arguing with them. And we're thinking, if only I could smack you and kill you. But the if only is sad because we come to realize that this is a wrestling match that will persist for the rest of our life. And we will always be fighting our demons. And that's what it means to be born a human. And that, by the way, is what it means to be born on the cusp of the flood. Because the waters are always raging. And there's always the threat of a flood that will destroy us. We have been through it this year. We were through it in World War II. And I'm speaking to people who lived in London. <laughs> I, I can't even begin to imagine what it would have been like to live through that. Um, it, it's, it's just a remarkable commentary, I think, on the human condition under the guise of telling a funny story about a baby born in prehistoric times. Let me just let me just open it up. We've got about five minutes left. And I, you know, my, my, my dear friends from this regular class, uh, any 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 thoughts any questions for Bert that um you know you've got an opportunity to ask someone who actually knows some midrash <laughs> uh, their thoughts anything anything on your mind sally hi hi i just wanted to ask right at the beginning it came more clear to me it came clearer as you went along but is the difference between halakha and haggadah that haggadah is narrative haggadah literally means lahagit to narrate to tell so it's so the it's narrative like and not what god told us to do but the way it's described is, is yes i would say agada hagada is a narrative of who we are whereas halakha is a command of how to behave so one's about behavior the other's about identity that's clear thank you ali my my, my version is law l a w as opposed to law l o r e oh nice that's nice too <laughs> yeah that only works if you have a british accent though Um, I, I, any, 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 any more for any more, um, but it has been just, you know, an, an incredible pleasure for me. Um, I have to say the bit that I missed, you know, going through that is the, the whole Roman legal piece, uh, your breadth and depth, not only in the texts of our own tradition, but, but their, their sisters and brothers and cousins and nephews and nieces and, you know, in so many different directions is, uh, is, you know, utterly remarkable. And, um, you know, uh, you, you spoke a couple of times about your work in and out of rabbinics and patristics. And, uh, you know, and you can do this in, in, in so many different ways. I, I think that detail is important. And in order to grasp the detail of Midrash, you not only need to know Judaism, but you need to know the culture in which Judaism is situated. So for me, it meant I had to learn first Roman pagan culture, and then Christian Byzantine culture, and ultimately Islamic culture, and now the culture, this, I don't know what it is, uh, parv post-Christian culture that we live in. 
And that's important. But it's also important to see the big picture as I tried to end my, my reading, that this is about um, not just a little baby struggling with a demon. This is our own struggle with our own demons. And, and that's very powerful as well. Jeremy, I want to wish you 70 years plus three days more of uh, a great rabbinate, great mastery of Midrash and uh, the leadership that you have demonstrated. Uh, this hundred Svansuk, happy birthday. Uh, but it's an early birthday present for me. I'm enormously grateful. And to you, to Sally, to all your family, to your friends, to your dear friends at, uh, and colleagues at, at JTS, uh, thank you so much on, the, on, a, on an important time for you to may, uh, may this next chapter open up beautifully and broadly uh, to all of you. Thank you all so much. Uh, we'll be back uh, in this room at our usual time of 12.30 uh, next week. Um, but again, thank you so much. Thank you. Good Thank to you see you all. Thank you. Thank you. It's so interesting. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much indeed.